Welcome everybody to Gun Owners Radio in our new studio and our new time. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have Adam Crowd as our guest. We're going to talk about a few things. And of course, Alicia. How are you, Alicia? Well. Yeah, did you have a good week? I did. Good, good, good. Um, okay, so first off, something we wanted to start is uh, we don't talk nearly enough about, you know, there's only two poli- or there's only two tools in politics, and that's people and money. And we don't talk near enough about raising money for Second Amendment causes. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a little initiative that we're going to have ongoing called Putting the Dough Back in Donate. Uh, so every week we're going to feature a new organization that we're going to put the dough back in Donate. And this week, for obvious reasons, it's Second Amendment Foundation. So if you could please... 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever you can do. Second Amendment Foundation is a fantastic uh, uh, ally for the Second Amendment. They've been fighting for so long. We're going to hear more about all the good that they've done from uh, Adam here, who's the executive director of Second Amendment Foundation. So I'm asking you to please take a minute and go to saf.org slash individual, saf.org slash individual, and uh, make a quick donation to uh, Second Amendment Foundation. They've done such a good job so many so many things to talk about um so thanks for listening so check your check check out our website go to our social media make sure everybody you know knows that our new time is five to seven every sunday the best place to listen to us is youtube.com slash gun owners radio and thank you discount gun mart on marina for hosting us discount gun mart has been generous um to allow us to broadcast from their their inner bowels of the discount gun mart gun shop so thank you guys uh fantastic shop you guys are always so so helpful uh gun truth of the week so i thought this was interesting i wanted to bring this up before we before we launch in according to the center for disease control and prevention that's the cdc americans use their firearms defensively between five hundred thousand times a year and three million times per year the most extensive study on defensive gun use, or DGUs, found that an average of 6,849 people defend themselves with guns daily. That's a statistic that I try to get into every interview, whether it is radio, TV, or whatever. I try to talk about that as often as I can because nobody talks about that. that. Everyone talks about all the bad things that happen and a gun's involved. But they don't talk about the fact that so many people have prevented a violent attack because they were able to defend themselves with a gun. And DGUs, that's another, I think if you're out there and you're an activist and you care about the Second Amendment, DGUs, that should be a part of your your vocabulary when you're talking to people. Talk about DGUs. Okay, so now we're going to do a lawsuit update. The idea of the lawsuit update is actually roll the (laughs) roll the thing. think that Okay, so the idea is we want to tell you exactly what happened in the in the lawsuit world, in the in the world of uh, new laws and as well as the world of lawsuits, so we can be your one stop quick shop and talk about exactly or, or so that you know exactly what happened or some of the important things that happened in the courtroom, some of the important things that happened in Sacramento and Washington D.C. First up is there are actually 17 new laws dealing with firearms signed into law by Newsom uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It's way too in-depth to talk about each of the 17. So I can't go into each of the 17 all at once, but we're going to just kind of take these apart and talk about them uh, every show, especially the ones um, that are, uh, you know, going into effect. I want to make sure that you know. Um, So the first one we're going to talk about, it actually, uh, the 17 include a storage restriction, which was SB 53, uh, which increases the, expands the storage law and uh, increases the consequences. It actually doesn't take effect till 2026. Um, but basically what it says is, if you're, unless you're touching your firearm, it has to be locked away. That's the most, that's the most uh, I would say the most uh, 
the, the safest view of it. They basically said it has to be within your control. I think a lot of people would, would suggest that within your control means within arm length. Um, but the reality is you're not completely and totally safe uh, from the law, from this law, unless your firearm in your ha- house is completely locked up or taken apart and inoperable. It used to be, and of course they talk about how this helps saves the kids, it helps saves the children, think of the children. The reality is your gun already has to be legally inaccessible to children. So this um, goes, it doesn't matter. It has nothing, whether there are kids anywhere near you, kids in your house, your gun has to be uh, um, inoperable. Um, it makes it to California, like the city limits of San Diego does that. Yeah, San Diego does it. Actually, the county of San Diego does too, but it's just in the unincorporated area. So if you live in one of the 18 cities, it doesn't matter unless you live in, I think it's Del Mar, Solano Beach, San Diego, where it's just, uh, you know, um, and, and the key word is readily controlled. Mm-hmm. They say if it's got, if, unless it's readily controlled by you, it has to be locked or inoperable. And they're really splitting a hair. You know, back in 2008, the Heller versus DC case was the big Second Amendment case um, that, uh, you know, reaffirmed what we already knew, which is the Second Amendment's an individual case. And what they were doing was the Washington, DC basically said if, you're, if your gun was in your house, it had to be inoperable or locked up. And the Supreme Court said, nope, that's unconstitutional. So what's different about this and that law? Well, they're splitting a hair. I, I don't think there is a difference. I think they're both unconstitutional. But what they're claiming in Sacramento is that this readily controlled piece of, of the legislation is going to save them from being found unconstitutional or unconstitutional. So that's one of the laws. It doesn't happen until 2026. Um, I just wanted everybody to be aware. And we're going to talk about the other 16 for sure. Um, Snow versus Brown. So the Supreme Court's back in session Monday, October 7th. They're considering taking an assault weapons case. Snope used to be um, Bianchi, right? Yes. Snope used to be Bianchi. It's now Snope. Um, It could very well be the one that ends assault weapon bans uh, throughout the entire nation. We'll have to wait and see. This is out of the Fourth Circuit, uh, which is um, specifically Maryland. Um, And it's uh, basically it's your run-of-the-mill, good old-fashioned AR pattern. AK semi-automatic uh, weapon uh, uh, ban, um, and uh, part of the decision, part of the um, part of the part of the decision to uphold the ban, um, it was stated in essence they're designed for military operation and not for self-defense. Is is was the quote, or at least part of the quote? So that's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, uh, the judge the, the, before the Supreme Court said, hey. Um, these were designed for military use, not for self-defense. Therefore, they can be banned. Well, I think that they're going to find it really, really difficult to um, continue that argument. I don't think the Supreme Court is going to with uphold that argument. I think that it's pretty easily um, proven that no, they're they're absolutely protected by the Second Amendment. But uh, keep your eye out for that. Oh, and that they're excessively dangerous. That's actually a term, and Adam, maybe you and I can talk about that when we when we interview. That's that's one thing I really wanted to talk to you about. That excessively dangerous, dangerous. Um, you know, firearms. I, I think it's important to go into a better definition and better explanation of what dangerous is. You know, dangerous uh, would indicate that just your mere presence, just if they're, if you're just touching it, if it's just sitting there, that it could somehow hurt you, which is completely untrue. Like, you know, something that is radioactive is, is dangerous, you know? Mm. And, uh, whereas a firearm is no more dangerous than a, than a hammer while it's, while it's sitting there, you know? And I think that that's an important point that I'd like to talk to you more about when we, uh, when we do our interview, uh, the Miller two case Miller, of course, one of our founding board members, Jim Miller, who by the way is running for reelection. And I walked some neighborhoods for him on Saturday. So please, 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 uh, make a donation and get involved and help Jim Miller win. But Miller, the first Miller case is the assault weapons case that we've had two positive rulings on from St. Benitez. Um, but part of that case, the Miller two case, as they call it, is the state of California said, hey, uh, if you're going to sue based on Second Amendment, based on guns and lose, then we're going to bankrupt you is in essence what they said. And so uh, uh, our attorneys uh, said, nope, that's not right, and spun off a whole separate case from that case. And FPC submitted arguments to the Ninth Circuit last week 
Um, it's it's what they call a fee shifting case, uh, which is meant to end. It's really truly meant to end all challenges to Second Amendment law in California. Uh, maybe we could get your take on that too when we interview Adam, um, because it really feels like it's just a harassment step. You know what I mean? It's not. There's no way that everyone anyone ever thought that this was going to stand in court. Um, but rest assured that uh, folks are fighting it. We're all on the same team here, and we're all fighting hard to make sure it happens. AB 1483, yeah, AB 1483, and the, and the win-win, that's N-G-U-Y-E-N. Michelle Wynn is the plaintiff. Uh, she's also a member of San Diego County Gun Owners. Her case helped get the 1 in 30 rule booted. Now, what's happening is AB 1483, AB 1483, is attempting to expand that 1 in 30 rule so that it covers private parties, so private party transfers. Mm -hmm. So what's going to be interesting is AB 1483 passed, making a 1 in 30 rule for private party transfers, but the win case said that, hey, there are no more 1 in 30 Bans. That's that's you know uh, that that's not allowed when it comes to you know buying from a shop. So uh, hopefully that win will map over and affect AB 1483 before it takes effect in January 2025. So that's what we're hoping for. And then let's see. The last case I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is Supreme Court is taking a suit from see the US Supreme Court agreed on a week ago Friday to hear a bid by US gun maker Smith and Wesson uh, it opens a new tab in firearms wholesaler interstate arms to throw out Mexico's lawsuit accusing them of aiding the illegal trafficking of firearms to Mexico drug cartels the justices took up an appeal by the two companies of a lower court's refusal to dismiss Mexico's suit, which was filed in federal federal court in Boston in 2021 under the 2005 U.S. law that broadly shields gun companies from liability and crime. Okay, so basically, what they're Mexico is saying, hey, Smith and Wesson, you guys made a bunch of guns, and then some people illegally used them or used them for illegal activity. Therefore, we're going to make you guys pay. You guys are somehow liable. I this this. Uh, has been fought before um, to some degree, and it just doesn't make any sense. You know, spoons don't make people fat. Uh, you know, no one blames Ford when somebody drinks and drives. It doesn't make any sense at all. I think it's a last-ditch effort. I think we're seeing a lot of these are last-ditch efforts. The anti-gun folks have tried so many things, and they've come up with so many different ways to try to mess up your Second Amendment rights that they're kind of grasping at straws. And uh, so they're doing everything they possibly can. And I think hopefully this is, uh, I don't know, their swan song. <laughs> their swan song is they die a slow death of uh, trying to screw up our, our Second Amendment rights. Pathetic last attempt. It is a pathetic last attempt. Um, okay, so this big one is I want to talk about Garland versus Vanderstock. Um, this has to do with ghost guns. The Supreme Court heard arguments on ghost guns. And I got to tell you, so it was very, very interesting. Um, I've heard a lot of commentators talk about this, and they've been very, very positive on it. And this is FPC and... and we intervened in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah and Second Amendment Foundation. Now, I 100,000% agree with the case you guys made, but I'm seeing a lot of commentators say, oh, geez, they just absolutely, like Alito just slammed them. And I, I'm, I don't think it's as, as uh, clear-cut a victory as what I've seen other commentators um, say. Uh, now, I obviously I'm on the right side of this thing. I'm not talking about my opinion, but I'm wondering how the how the uh, uh, judges are going to uh, rule on this. And I wanted to play a couple of things real quick here. We're going to try to play. Just, uh, what would what is the purpose of selling a receiver without the uh, holes drilled in it? Well, there are some individuals, in, just like some individuals enjoy uh, like working on their car every weekend, some individuals want to construct their own firearms. So the purpose of selling it well, is to allow, I'm sorry, go ahead. is to assist and provide individuals with material with which they can do that. Well, I mean, drilling a hole or two, uh, I would think, doesn't give the same sort of reward that you get from working on your car on the weekends. Well, I would uh, encourage the court to read uh, 
the Vasquez brief. This is not a uh, easy thing necessarily to do, and particularly the Press Democrat article cited there where the reporter uh, engaged to show how easy this was, and in fact showed that he couldn't actually do it. He had to uh, engage uh, friends to help him complete this that were expert in the firearms and, the, and even once you have a complete frame. So that's Roberts. That's uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Roberts uh, asking the question. And, you know, I'm certainly not a legal guru, but I'm not entirely convinced that he walked away with a full understanding of exactly what's going on with home manufactured firearms. And I, I'm and that I, I think I'm a little worried. But the other one I wanted, the other uh, quote I wanted to show, or the other back and forth I wanted to show was uh, Supreme Court Justice Alito talking to the opposing attorney. And let's play a little bit of that. That way. Is it the is it the case that components that can easily be converted into something? constitute that thing before they are converted as a matter of ordinary usage i think that as a matter of ordinary usage we're not suggesting that any statutory reference to one thing includes separate and distinct things that can be readily converted so shifting to our arguments under frame or receiver subparagraph no, no, no I, I want to stick with the definition of weapon for just a second oh sure i show you here's a here's a blank pad and here's a pen all right is this a grocery list I don't think that that's a grocery list, but the reason for that is because there are a lot of things you could use those products for to create something other than a grocery list. Right, and so I it's show, not like they're... If I show you, uh, I put out on a counter some eggs, some chopped up ham, some chopped up pepper and onions. Uh, is that a Western omelet? No, because again, those items have well-known other uses to become something other than an omelet. The key difference here is that these weapon parts kits are designed and intended to be used as instruments of combat, and they have no other conceivable use. Okay, I think that's the key point here. Now again, I completely agree with the, uh, the case being made against Garland. And it's as if they're not even paying attention to um, the end of Chevron deference. It's pretty clear cut to me that the, the Congress uh, has a definition of what a firearm is, and they're trying to expand that defer, the definition without going through the legal process. However, what she's saying is, hey, you know, first off, Alito said, hey, look, you have all the ingredients here for a Western omelet. Is it, an, is it a Western omelet or is it not an, a Western omelet until we make a Western omelet? Well, that's a good point, but her rebuttal to that, her answer to that was that these kits have only one purpose that it's not a chunk of metal that you could use for other purposes the only purpose for this is to turn it into a firearm and so her case is therefore it's a firearm i don't agree with it i think it's you know total bs and they need to go through the proper uh, uh you know channels and go through the legal process but i also think that that is the kind of argument that could easily sway uh, you know, a couple of justices that don't understand what's going on. And I am worried about that. And um, I'm not as positive as some of the other commentators I've seen talk about this. They are looking at this like it's an open and shut case. And I got to tell you, a lot of those guys are smarter than I am. So maybe it is. But <laughs> I, I went back and heard this thing and thought, ooh, this, this doesn't sound as open and shut as I thought. Her criteria of putting on it that it, it has no other purpose other than be a firearm, that may or may not be a true statement, but why is that the defining? She's creating that category. Excellent, excellent segue. So Justin, Justice Brown Jackson, let me play a little bit of what she said. So you, prevented the, you, you presented the court with the critical machining um, alternative, and you say you have these two alternatives. The agency has presented yet another way of going about this. Do you concede that under uh, a facial challenge, like the one that you brought, your task is actually to demonstrate that your alternatives are the only permissible ones under the statute? Well, I think it's under a rule of party presentation. We've presented the court with the alternatives that have occurred to anyone so i think these are the best alternatives so that you see the question 
as what is the best alternative and the court is just supposed to say we have three options here which one do we think the best the agency didn't pick the best it's rule well, stricken well i think we actually don't have that i think our burden is to show that the agencies is wrong maybe we don't have the right interpretation but if their interpretation is incorrect then they're asking the wrong question I boom that is the the crux of the case in my opinion mm -hmm. is that basically hey look um you know yeah sure we suggested some things here but, and, you know, you, you could talk about, you know, well, gee, it only has one use or it has multiple uses, these kits. But the reality is the only thing we have to prove is that uh, he was wrong, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, Merrick Garland was wrong. And uh, hopefully if they can, if, he, if that part of the argument wins with at least the majority of the Supreme Court, then I believe we'll have a favorable ruling. But if they start getting squirrely and creative – then I'm worried. <laughs> then I'm really worried. I'm really worried. Which, by the way, how fortunate are we that Garland isn't a Supreme Court justice? Pretty, pretty fortunate. I mean, how close? <laughs> how close? close? How close do we get to that? Uh, too close. Very too, too close. close. Too close. And so I got to tell you, I think all the people who said, "Oh no, he's going to be great. He's a middle of the road guy. Democrats and Republicans, everyone's going to love him." And now he's the Attorney General, and he is a nightmare. <laughs> Well, in, in in fairness, his job as Attorney General, regardless of who the AG is in their party, their job is to defend the laws of the United States and the regulations. So, out of out of fairness, now not saying that he would have done us any favors had he been a Supreme Court justice. Don't don't take that the wrong way. Right. But you know, the AG's job is to defend the laws of the United States when they get sued. Um, so he he was going to do it one way or another. Uh, fortunately, he's not up there writing opinions though on on this particular topic because I'm pretty sure we could guess how that would turn out. Out. Yeah, he has a different set of responsibilities. Yes, job. I get it. Yep. I get it. I'm still extremely ha happy and thankful. That yes, no, 100. percent So, all right, let's. Uh, so that's your legal update for the week. Um, that was brought to you by our good buddy John Dillon. Now, I'm not an attorney. None of this is legal advice. Please do your own research. Listen to a properly licensed California attorney. John Dillon is exactly one of those guys. He is a California licensed attorney. He's been a big supporter of San Diego County Gun Owners. In fact, he's been here from the beginning. He's been with Gun Owners Radio from the beginning. Fantastic guy, wonderful guy. All your Second Amendment needs, uh, he's been wonderful. So check him out at DillonLawGP.com. DillonLawGP.com, and it's number 760-642-7150. Okay, so next what we're going to do is we're going to uh, interview you. Adam, you ready for that? Do I have a choice? No. Yeah, okay. Absolutely then no I'm ready. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. This interview is brought to you by Cargo Cases and Rugged Gear Outfitters. They're in Elko and they're a brand new sponsor. Uh, Michael is the owner. He's a fantastic guy. They make cases like uh, competitors, to, like, like cases that you'd put like a like a drone in or, or photography equipment or or guns or whatever you're carrying. But they also sell some really cool stuff. Like, would you buy Alicia? Uh, the food dehydrator. You bought a food dehydrator. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Freeze dryer. Freeze dryer. Freeze dryer. Uh, they have all kinds of really cool. Um, uh, you know, I want to call it. You know, we're watching everything that happens on on the East Coast with all the hurricanes. And mm -hmm. a lot of people were unprepared. Oh, yeah. And we don't have hurricanes here, thank goodness. But we do have earthquakes. And I got to tell you, um, a lot of the stuff, you know, it's good for camping. It's good for travel. It's good for, you know, all those needs. But it's also, look at him as a good source of earthquake preparedness. Everything preparedness. Exactly. So yeah. check him out. He's on 423 Broadway, El Cajon, California. Use GOR for a 10% discount on their website. And just mention Gun Owners Radio or SDCGO when you go into the store. And thank thank Michael and his crew when you go yeah. in. It's the old gun exchange location. Yeah. Old El Cajon yep. Gun Exchange, if you know where yep. that is. Right behind the uh, taco, uh, shop. taco shop. Yeah. That doesn't really narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is right behind a taco shop in San Diego. Okay, so we talked about it earlier, Second Amendment Foundation. Yep. You guys have such a rich history. Um, you've been so fantastic in the Second Amendment world. Uh, most people know who Alan Gottlieb is. Uh, I've seen him around. I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, a couple of weekends ago at the Gun Rights Policy Convention, which was uh, our conference, which was really, really was really awesome. I can tell you, I, I don't really get all I don't get all fired up about meeting people, you know, famous people, whatever. Don't really get all fired up. I got fired up. I really enjoyed meeting him. We had a we had a great conversation. Um, I was very impressed. I didn't know 
as much as I do now about Second Amendment Foundation. Um, but, uh, uh, gosh, I'm just so impressed and just so happy that you're here. Adam Kraut, you're the executive director of yeah. Second Amendment Foundation. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So, Gun Rights Policy Conference, tell us about that. How, how did it go? Sure. Uh, so, it went well, very well. Uh, we were happy to be here in San Diego. And, you know, thank you to you and San Diego County Gunners for helping us uh, not only promote the event, but attend and speak. You know, we're gr very grateful for the participation from you from you folks. Um, Your speakers were great. Thank you. You guys had a lot of great speakers. I was very, very interested in so many. Um, oh, his name just fell out of my head. He's an author, Mark Mark Smith. Smith. Mark Smith. Yeah. Holy cow, that guy blew me away. Yeah, Mark Smith is. Uh, he's got a very popular YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, Four Boxes Diner, but he's one of the guys that you know is out there explaining lawsuits and what's going on in them nowadays. Uh, since I stopped doing that years ago, fortunately for me, uh, they're trying to get me to do it again. But there's a lot of people who picked up that mantle, and Mark is one of them, and he's uh, done a very good job of educating the public as to what's happening, what does it mean, and how does it affect you, which is all important in the uh, you know the Second Amendment space of just having an educated populace. So, um, but the convention or the conference rather was great. Um, there were, you know, uh, two days, a day and a half of speakers from all over the country talking about various issues, whether they were legal or legislative. And, you know, we had uh, activists on stage. We had two fireside chats, one with state legislatures about, you know, laws being passed in Unfortunately, only pro-gun states because the two people from other states were unable to make it. One actually uh, pro-gun state as well, but the hurricane affected him. Mm. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we had uh, Representative Daryl Issa, your representative uh, in the federal uh, Congress here uh, with the fireside chat and talking about how things work at the federal level and some of the work that he's been doing to protect the Second Amendment. So uh, I think everybody who attended got a, a lot out of it. And certainly if you were unable to attend, uh, it is captured on YouTube. So you can go check that out. We haven't gotten around to it yet because we've been still busy with things post-conference, uh, but we will be chopping up those videos to individual segments so that it'll be easy for people to find the presentations that they want to either go back and watch or that they just want to watch on their own without having to go through a whole day's worth of stuff. Cool. And it was uh, the timing was really, really good, too, is, is what I mean, is like the flow. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys, it never got bogged down. Uh, you know, I never caught myself looking at my watch. It was... You know, like uh, straight to the point, uh, super interesting. Uh, what, what was your favorite part? What do, you, what do you think went the best? So I think my favorite part about it is the people in, in meeting people. The presentations, for me, given what I do for a living and where I am, none of it's really new information for me. Um, so I, I have that problem, if you will. But I think a lot of the benefit of attending the event in person is what happens on the breaks and in the evenings where you get to go and rub shoulders with all the people that are making moves in the second amendment space and being able to pick their brains and talk with them and, and form new relationships that yeah. you can call them up later on down the road and say hey i've got this question i know this is kind of your area like what what advice can you give me or can you help with this uh be it any number of those things uh, i'll give you a quick example there uh we have a, a group doctors for responsible gun ownership uh one of the doctors who attended does stuff with hearing and he sits uh, i believe he was petitioning the group of doctors who oversee that field or something to come out with a position paper as it related to silencers Silencer. yeah, no, good. and how you know they would help people preserve their hearing. And he was very excited because we had the guys from the American Suppressor Association and the General Council of Silencer Shop attend there. So they were able to get introduced and now they're going back and forth with each other. Uh, and he's going to be able to use, I think, some of the information they've provided to help him kind of uh, get that along. So that's just one example of how that kind of works. Meeting new people, getting to meet everybody, meeting other activists, meeting other personalities, uh, number one feedback. You know, when, when yeah. people talk to me about, you know, the weekend, they all talk about who they met, you know, uh, who they got to talk to. Um, it was really, really wonderful. And again, I, I, that was the highlight of my weekend was I got to talk to uh, Alan Gottlieb, which was, which was really amazing. What's it like working with him? Uh, it's great. It, yeah. I, I gotta say it's great. So it, here's the anecdotal story. I joined SAF as a life member in 2013, same time I joined NRA. And my understanding of the whole world back then was NRA were the people that were on Capitol Hill and in state legislatures doing all the lobbying. And I knew they had some litigation, but SAF was really the, the organization doing the litigation. And I can remember seeing Alan being interviewed and thinking, wow, what an amazing guy. He had this idea, this vision that he put to, he, he created, uh, you know, and, and marshaled all these people to be able to do this work. 
I uh, never in a million years thought I'd ever be talking or work, let alone working with him. And then I met him one time and he was super friendly and personable and he, he's got that just bubbly, charming, outgoing personality. Um, and wow, this is, this is amazing. Now this, he's more real. And then I can remember, uh, you know, when I was at my former employer talking uh, to him because we were doing cases together like we are now. And uh, this relationship got closer and closer. And then when I left, I called him and had a couple conversations. And I ended up here. Now I'm working for the guy. And it's just, <laughs> it's very weird and, and surreal that somebody you looked at, or for me anyway, that I saw on TV, you know, almost 10 years ago. It, now I talk to the guy all the time. Yeah. And he's just hes just another guy. Yeah. He's just another person. But he ha- he's very passionate about this. And I mean, he has fun doing it. He loves it. Like, he lives for this. This is what he enjoys. So working for him is great. Yeah, that's all. It must be. I mean, he really is just lives and breathes and exudes Second Amendment. Yeah. And uh, I was, I was, it was really nice. He, he, he uh, I just kind of saw him in passing at, at the, you know, the happy hour after and just, you know, went and said hello. And he sat there and, and he talked to me for, for quite a while yeah. um, and was engaged. Yes. And it wasn't a bunch of... Uh, bumper stickers he was like he was engaged in the conversation he really wanted to know uh you know what we were doing it was a meaningful interaction yeah Yeah. so i was very impressed very very cool for those who aren't as familiar with with second amendment foundation or saf right saf saf um those who aren't as familiar with saf um what do they need to know if you're if you're an activist in san diego right now and you're you're you love second amendment Mm -hmm. you're not quite sure uh where saf fits in what should they know well uh We are 501c3, so we don't do the grassroots lobbying or lobbying at all. Um, But what we do do is litigation and education. And for over 50 years now, because this was our 50th anniversary, which was actually August 26th. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, Well, congratulations to Alan, not so much me. I've only been here almost (laughs) two, not even two years yet. But um, so the organization's been around for quite a while. And its history, the, the, the bumper sticker version, if you will, is... He had a vision back in 74, how do we elevate a case to the Supreme Court? And what he did was gather lawyers and scholars, and they started writing position papers and starting being published in law reviews and things like that. You get the Legal Scholars Conference in the 70s. You get Gun Rights Policy Conference in the 80s. You get some some of the original lawsuits in the, uh, I think the I think it's the 80s. You'll have to forgive me, my, my brain's dried up but um you know one of the first lawsuits that was filed was against then mayor diane feinstein's total handgun ban in in san francisco and we won and then we challenged the same exact law out in connecticut and won isn't that crazy Mm -hmm. that i don't think people realize if you go back and watch even like there's some like movie snippets or whatever back in the late 80s and, and early 90s especially there was a push to completely eliminate civilian ownership of handguns handgun control inc comes to mind isn't that crazy Prior to brady yeah mm-hmm. I, there's a couple there's in fact there's a movie where uh uh oh who was the guy he the president uh it was a movie about the president he was a single dad and he was dating and it was uh uh oh man. sounds plausible yeah right yeah <laughs> it was uh oh man anyway um and and uh Part of the part of the deal was he was losing the public, mm-hmm. and so they they were basically saying like, look, you need to pass your crime bill, which included a one hundred percent handgun ban. Yeah, like that's in our lifetime. Yeah, and, no, it, and, it's wild. And now I got to tell you, I think if somebody came out and said, hey, look, we're going to do a one hundred percent handgun ban, that would be political suicide. Hundred percent. And and I the important part, what I want people to, and I've talked about this a little bit before, but what I want people to take away from that is that it's the work of groups uh, like SAF and you know Second Amendment activists who have made that into political suicide. Yes. That didn't just happen. No, it, it didn't. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, over time that has continued to uh, the public positioning on the acceptance of firearms and that the Second Amendment is an individual right and not this collective right of only the militia. Um, you're right. That did not happen overnight. And I think when people, particularly on the Internet, argue about what groups or, you know, way back, you know, talking in the 30s and, and before this was really an idea, it's that the public didn't understand it was an individual right. Yeah. And, you know, that education has happened, that research into the nation's founding in history, which is the temporal time period in which we're supposed to use to understand what it means, 
shows that it absolutely is an individual right and it's totally untethered to militia service and that when you were mustered you were to bring your individual stuff right. to the militia muster so uh, it's certainly been a change in in the public's education and understanding and that's one of the things that we've been doing so gun rights policy conference goes right to the education aspect the litigation started pretty early in the 90s you get a handful more more lawsuits and you talked earlier about smith and wesson yeah and the the case that the supreme court is going to hear well Prior to the Protection of Lawful Commerce of Arms Act being passed under the Bush administration, you had all of these mayors everywhere suing handgun manufacturers with what goal? To put them out of business. And and it was lawfare. It's what we see today, but just earlier. And so SAF actually sued a bunch of these mayors back then over that. Ultimately, it wasn't successful, but SAF saw that that was, in fact, an existential threat to the Second Amendment because if you put the manufacturers out of business, how could you possibly acquire arms to exercise your right? So you get Protection of Lawful Commerce of Arms Act. 2008, as you mentioned, you get Heller. And Heller is really where the floodgates open. So since Heller, and well, since our founding, not since Heller, we've been involved in over 260 lawsuits, either mm -hmm. as a lawsuit we filed, one we funded, or filing an amicus in somebody else's lawsuit. And actually, that number is probably 270 now, if I had to guess. I got to go count the cases. Um, we currently, you wanted to talk about California, why San Diego gun owners should care. Yeah, We have, I think, 15 active cases in California, some of which yep. we're partners on. Yeah. Uh, some we partnered with CRPA on, but we're challenging all of the nonsense that comes out of California. And the reason is uh, twofold. One, those bad ideas are exported and they go elsewhere. Yeah. And then we have to deal with that nonsense in other parts of the country. But two, there's no reason that you Californians who are gun owners, where there's millions of you, should have some kind of second tier Second Amendment. You should get the same Second Amendment everybody else gets. And everybody else should get the same Second Amendment that the founders guaranteed us. And that's what we're striving towards. So the litigation is a massive component of what we're doing today. The education aspect is something that we're also, we've done. Uh, and that's a component that we're building out a new uh, form for to go into the future here in 2025. So I'm very excited about that. And the reason is because if you have a more educated gun owning populace and just general populace, the more appreciative and perhaps uh less likely they would be to allow politicians to infringe on that right and i think the context i use to explain this to people is back at the time of the founding everybody understood why the founders adopted the first and the second and the fourth amendments like they saw what the british did the problem is is that if those lessons aren't taught generationally and as society changes people forget and you get further away temporally from when these atrocities were committed you, you get a populace that doesn't understand and says, well, we don't really need that. You see it right now in the First Amendment context. Well, we should be able to stop speech that's mean because it hurts people's feelings. Well, you know, there is a solution for that. We as society just shun those people. They can say whatever they want, but we don't have to accept it. No, not to say that there aren't limitations, but the Second Amendment, I think, is one of those things where people say, well, we live in a great country. The government would never do any things. You know, I hate to use the Nazi Germany example, but you look at what happened in Nazi Germany. You look at any number of more contemporary salute, uh, countries where there have been uh, governments that have oppressed people. And that really, at, at root, is what the Second Amendment is for, you know, to stop tyrannical governments and also an in, in individual right of armed self-defense. And people forget the Constitution didn't give us these rights. They just simply codified a pre-existing right and prevent the government from infringing on it. So that's really what we're here to do. Uh, we're having a blast doing it. Um, I'm having a good time, but I, I wish I didn't have to. Yeah. I, I would be great that one day there was just, just okay, we're done. <laughs> close up shop and I go find something else to do. Maybe I'll do that uh, like bake sale dough for your organization. <laughs> Doesn't it, uh, it feels to me like recently, especially, especially since, um, since uh, what was the last case? Two years ago, last Supreme court case, second amendment case. Bruin. Bruin. Holy cow. <laughs> especially since Bruin, um, it feels like, it feels like, the good things are tangible mm -hmm. is is the only way I can really you know what I mean like yeah. Heller was like cool and then McDonald was like great SAF case by the way so yeah McDonald's mm -hmm. a SAF case yeah. right and um, that all felt great but it also felt like it didn't feel like we were quite out of the woods Bruin it really feels like okay this this is a tangible uh -huh. thing like this is a 
this is a this is a real tool that they're handing us that we're going to actually see real results from. So, yes, but no. Ooh. Bruin didn't say anything. Heller didn't. Right. If you look at what Bruin says, it's, it says it, the only thing it did do was get more in depth into carry and the bounds of carry. But even Heller said that, you know, you can carry a firearm for offensive purposes, you know, in your coat or your pocket, whatever. It already said what the test was. The circuit court screwed all that up hmm. for years. And I have a feeling we're going to see it again with the circuit courts. We're already seeing them playing games with, well, how can we kind of take these, this language the Supreme Court gave us and find ways around it you look at the seventh circuit the assault weapons ban challenge Harold over there uh the seventh circuit uh judge uh his name's escaping me i think it was easter day um you know wrote a, an opinion that just eviscerated what bruin said you look at what the fourth circuit did in snope you know we're that's our cert petition with other groups uh the fourth circuit did what they did in colby they said like that's great you have this test who cares? Yeah. We're just going to invent our own out of whole cloth, and and we're going to use some like language here that's really dicta to hang our hat on. And if you don't take it, Supreme Court, well, guess what? That becomes the law of the circuit. And the problem is when it becomes a law of one circuit, if other circuits haven't really decided that issue yet, they're going to go, hey, we're going to import that idea over here. Well, the Fourth Circuit said X, so we're going to do that here. Right now, the Ninth Circuit hasn't ruled on any of its assault weapons ban challenges, and we know that post Heller, the Ninth Circuit. If you, even if you got a favorable panel decision on Bonk, they said, cool, California will help you out. That law is constitutional. Good luck to everybody. So I think in that regard, uh, you know, Bruin certainly has helped. And there's certainly been a lot of wins post-Bruin. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I think the circuit courts eventually, given enough time, will screw it up. And here's something. Here's <laughs> well, something. I, I, here's I'm the not, why. I, I definitely won't argue with you that the Ninth Circuit Court is probably going to screw things uh -huh. up. <laughs> but here's here's the why. And people, I, I'm not talking in favor of any any candidate or anything like that. But the the danger in another four years of a non-pro-gun politician or even gun-neutral politician is that when you get to appoint judges who are lifetime tenure – even if they're not Supreme Court justices, SCOTUS doesn't have to take a case. So I think everybody knows, but just for clarification, a cert petition is when the uh, party who usually loses at the circuit court asks the Supreme Court to hear the case, and the court doesn't have to hear those. Out of the thousands they get every year, they only grant about 100 right now, which is actually down from prior uh, courts that had done it. So you get enough district court judges who find against the parties bringing challenges in Second Amendment grounds and enough circuit courts affirming that, I think we end up right back to a kind of a post-Heller landscape where, hey, the Supreme Court said X, but the circuit courts aren't going along along with it. It's an unfortunate potential reality. However, we'll keep racking up wins with our partners wherever we can and until that stops because we need to. We need to restore the Second Amendment. So what? So you've been there for two years. You've been at SAF for two years. Almost, yes. Almost two years. What, uh, what are some things that you want to emphasize or change or, or what, what direction do you want to help SAF go in? So you had mentioned earlier about some of you don't know about SAF, and, and the reality is a lot of people don't know about SAF. Uh, so one of the things that we did when we first came in was we, we took stock of the organization. And the thing that was very exciting to me was that there's a hell of a foundation that's built there. The problem, from my perspective, was they weren't very good at marketing themselves. And that's something we've worked very hard at. So we rebranded a little bit. We updated, you know, some new paint on the walls, things like that, uh, becoming far more active on social media where the conversation is being had. You want to talk about legacy media? I think we do a pretty good job and dominate a lot of that conversation. But when it comes to where people are having conversations today, there wasn't um, a good program in place. So we're, we're working very hard to change that so that people do, in fact, uh, you know, come to an online community that we're building on the various social media pages and elsewhere so that's one of the big things from just an awareness standpoint of hey we exist this is the work we're doing on your behalf whether you're a member or a donor or you're not we would love to have you but certainly regardless we're doing the work because we believe in it the second thing is our legal program's always been strong um but there's always room for improvement. So why sit and rest on our laurels? So we are identifying various ways in which we can improve the legal intensity. Uh, that is certainly one of the things we've always been very proud of is working with partners like San Diego County gun owners and others in states to come in and help them out. 
um, we see an opportunity to be effective and, and win. And we know that state groups or even local groups always don't have the funds to be able to just litigate because it's really expensive, as you know. So we work with our partners to identify things, and they're very helpful in helping us find plaintiffs in order to the, the vehicle we need to bring the lawsuit itself. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the educational component, that one's kind of really near and dear to my heart um, from my time on YouTube doing the legal brief, where the best compliment I ever got was, hey, I learned something from you. Yeah. And I think that education helps, um, it, it just, it, it builds a better rapport with the public, number one. And number two, there's a lot of people that are uneducated on it. And once they're shown a pathway to getting good information with with the source data, which I think is important, not everybody's going to look at it, but if you're going to say something, at least back it up, uh, you know, like a, an academic article kind of. Um, what, what does that mean with the source data? Like not just having an opinion, but actually. Yeah. Okay. Not just having an opinion, but hey, here's where the information came from. So sure. whether, you know, whether it's the explanation of a law, well, here's a citation to the law, or this is what the case means. And here's where that comes out of in, in the case or, you know, any number of things. But educating the public so that people can be better informed, whether they're gun owners, pro-gun, on the fence, anti-gun, that all plays into the long-term objective of you need to understand why this is important and where this comes from. Uh, so that's something, as I mentioned, that we're, we're working diligently on to build out um, because I think it, it's an important uh, area that not a lot of people are doing. I think there's a lot of individuals, but you know, it, there's always room for others and, and to do that. So that's what we're working on. What should instructors be talking to their students about? I mean, other than just the, you know, the, you know, the four rules and the, yeah. you know, <laughs> the basics of, of function work. If, if you were going to give advice to instructors mm -hmm. who are teaching people, you know, maybe they're brand new, maybe they've never carried concealed. Now they can get their CCW. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are some things that instructors should be getting across to their students? You're now invest. You need to be invested. I think one of the the problems, and I saw this from my time working behind a gun counter, is that it's always a I got mine, so who cares now? And I, that that is detrimental to the Second Amendment and gun rights. Yeah, you got yours, but what about your children or your grandchildren or your neighbor's kids or your neighbor for that matter? You know, don't you want a community that has the option if they choose to to exercise armed self defense? I do. Doesn't mean that I think everybody should have a gun. You don't want one? That's fine. I'm not going to tell you you need to go buy one. But I think instructors and trainers, um, they, they all need to make a point that these people need to get involved. Now, whether that's by virtue of the individual choosing to become an activist and, and calling their representatives or donating to a group like SAF or San Diego County Gun Owners, you know, there's... There's ways in which one can do it, but I think the point of you need to get involved and not just it, your responsibility uh, doesn't simply stop it. You bought the gun and you took a class and now it gets to sit under your bed or if you carry it or whatever that looks like, that you need to get involved in the political, unfortunately, the political fight over it because that's how long term this continues on. It is. And I, you do hear a lot of people say, Alicia, I know you've had students that are just like, well, I don't want to get involved in politics. Right. Well, that's fine. But politics are involved in you. Right. Yes. <laughs> you know, so it, that kind of doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I know Absolutely. you and I have talked about that. You've heard students say. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's it's uh, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, but it's understandable. I mean, you know, um, I get it, man. People are trying to live their life and they're trying to feed their kids and pay their taxes and just put gas in the tank, especially here in California. Everything's mm -hmm. so much more expensive. What, so, Adam, what what motivates you? Like, why is this important? You know, you got to feed your your yourself and your you know pay sure. your taxes and do everything. Why is this motive? Why did you turn your life over to this? It was something that was a personal injury. So my my story is kind of I think we talked about this before, but my story like there was no desire for me to end up here. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I want to do with my life. I want to do that. What I did was I took a year off after I had a graduated college with a degree in political science. What the hell am I going to do with this? So I took a year off. I was working, and I ended up, my dad, you know, kind of pushed me to go to law school. So, okay, I applied. I got in. Went as a night student so I could kind of put off being an adult a little another year. <laughs> yeah. uh, not the best decision, but I did it. And then I get towards the end and go, oh, I got to find something to make myself marketable for a job. I need to find an internship. 
and I happened to be on a Pennsylvania gun forum very frequently. And I was I was very passionate about guns and the Second Amendment, but I wasn't super involved politically other than kind of joining organizations and sharing things on social media and, and occasionally donating to groups when I had a couple extra bucks. Um, contacted this lawyer and said, hey, I'm coming towards the end here. I would really like an internship. I'm very interested in firearms and I see what you're doing and, and that sounds kind of neat. So we went back and forth and ultimately I ended up with an internship and that's where I worked for five years representing individuals and industry members um, in any number of different things. And then from there I moved to the, the nonprofit space. I basically got poached out of that job more or less, which was you know cool and, and that opened up a whole new world for me. And I, I think what motivates me today is seeing the impact we have on individuals and i think a lot of times that's um lost in the conversation you you know you talk broadly about assault weapons or you talk broadly about bans on carry but when you talk to the individuals that you're actually bringing the lawsuits on their behalf of and how it impacts their life and then you extrapolate that to how it would impact another individual's life that's what really motivates me at the end of the day like i want to make the world a place where those kinds of restrictions aren't imposed on people and that they can have the same right I have. Uh, and I think that's where it really motivates me today, um, you know, being able to have a positive impact. And look, you know, I've said this before, it's not a secret. Like, I want to make my mark and then be on my way. I don't, I don't need to be here forever, but I want to do as much good here while I can before there's somebody else that is chomping at the bit that has good ideas that are not mine that can take the reins and run with it. Yeah. You know what I really liked was recently, so the eleven percent tax, yeah, you know, the excise tax. Um, what I really liked about that lawsuit is it's the first lawsuit I can think of where everybody's in on the same lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, SAF, um, CRPA, NRA, yep. FPC. Who, did, did, did I miss anybody? I. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> everybody got fifty-five all, lawsuits. Yeah, I can't remember. Right. <laughs> All the big, but I guess what's important is all the big guys mm-hmm. came said, together. Yeah, came yeah. together, and I really, really liked that. I, I mean, I guess I was a little, bit, I was a little naive when I started San Diego County Gun Owners nine years ago. I was just like, "Hey guys, I'm here. Right, let's all be happy and not skip. on not on my turf. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a little. It was it was a little bit of a you know. I think there was a little bit of a, hey, look, we've been fighting this fight. Now you think you're going to show up and do anything, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, and there was a little bit of a, you need to prove yourself or whatever. And that's fine. I think we have. I think we've proven ourselves. I, I think we've done uh, more than what we expected we'd ever do. Um, so that's great. But I really, really, really like seeing everybody working together in the in the sandbox together. Yeah. And I, I, I got to tell you, I commend you guys for... You know, people wonder like, well, hey, how come there's two or three lawsuits that are doing the same thing or whatever? I like the fact that it was such an important statement uh, that you guys all got together and said, hey, we're on this. We're in this together. We're all going to work together. We're all going to be, you know, and uh, but what, what are your thoughts on that that lawsuit? Well, I hope we win for one. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thought. Uh, you know, a, a adding an additional tax uh, on on an item that's already taxed at the federal level with an excise tax, uh, it just it makes it more cost prohibitive for individuals to be able to exercise that right. And I think people lose sight of the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, particularly with the way the economy and, and things have been as of the last couple of years, that yeah. people are trying to put you know just basic things on the table or they're going into debt, putting food on the table and getting to and from work and all those things. So how on earth could I afford to not only buy a gun, but buy the ammunition and then find the time to train with it. And then you look at the insane things that come out of the legislature of, well, you should have mandatory training classes and all this other stuff to exercise your, before you can even exercise your rights. So you, you couple all those things together and it's like, this becomes very expensive, very quickly for, yeah. for me to be able to, to mm-hmm. do any of this. Um, so anyway, you know, we certainly think the tax is unconstitutional. We hope that the court is going to agree with us, but we're prepared to take that, you know, one and go swinging for the fences on it because it, it's trash. Is it hyperbole to call it a, uh, a poll tax to compare it to a poll tax? I don't think it's hyperbole. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's a question of whether courts will like it or not, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's any different than a poll tax at the end of the day. You're adding a, you're adding an additional tax on an item to be able to exercise a right. 
Uh, you know, we would today anyway, if somebody suggested that in order to vote, you had to pay $15 or what have you, everybody would be up in arms about that. Yeah. Um, you maybe, know. maybe literally. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe literally. Uh, same if, you know, you know, as it relates to speech, you want to say some things. Oh, well, now you got to pay money for it. Now we're not going to get into the permits and time, places and manner. And, the you know, if that kind of stuff because there are certain instances where you do have to pay to like hold a rally or something. But um, I, I think generally speaking, yeah, it would be fair to call it that. And it's okay. So am I making too much? Am I too, am I being too kumbaya with the whole, Hey, you guys are all on the same lawsuit. Or do you think that there's a new, there's a new level of cooperation that might be happening or, you know what I mean? Or am yeah. I, am I reading too much into this or do I, you think, Hey, I, it looks I like don't the think you're reading too much into it. So I, you know, again, to talk about SAF for a moment and then I'll get into your question. SAF has always tried to maintain great relationships with everybody. And certainly it, with the state level groups, um, that's always, been true we've always you know generally gotten along with a lot of the national groups as well um and the point being that like it's better to have friends than people that are just pissed off at you all the time trying to like shiv you in the back now there's certain times where strategically we may not join a lawsuit with somebody or somebody might not join a lawsuit with us or you may find a duplicative lawsuit filed elsewhere because hey maybe they chose to challenge the same law but in a different court uh, so you have two lawsuits going against that. But at the end of the day, it does become, you know, uh, uh, an expenditure of resources on everybody's behalf. And if you're litigating the same issue here, here, and here, uh, that causes, you know, groups to spend money that might not otherwise need to be spent. And then you have to deal with how that shakes out on appeal, too. What does that look like? Uh, are they consolidated? Are you fighting for briefing space now? Uh, like not, you know, not fighting, but you want to be able to say your part just as much as the other group wants to be able to say theirs. And the court says, well, you've got X number of words to do it in, and you all have to do it in the same brief. Well, I raised issues they didn't. They raised issues I didn't. Like, how do we address that and, and, and do it fairly? So um, it is generally better to work together, and we certainly try to have a good, healthy working relationship with any number of partners, uh, whether they're state or, or uh, national groups. What do you think we should be doing better? Second Amendment. I mean, you know, people that are engaged with the Second Amendment, maybe maybe gun owners is too broad a term, sure. you know, but people that care about the issue that are even somewhat engaged, what, what, do we, what do we need to be doing better? I think we need to be engaging people better that are, maybe it's the people who are gun owners, but they're not Second Amendment savvy activists, or maybe it's just the neighbor that has no clue. Right. Take them shooting, introduce, you know, and I'm not saying go tell them that you have an armory in your house if if you're (laughs) one of the lucky people who has one of those. But I think having what we as a society have seemingly lost is the ability just to have a conversation and perhaps even at the end of the conversation, walking away in disagreement with one another, but not going, you know what, like that dude's the enemy and I'm the devil to him. But just, hey, we have a different opinion on this. And we can still find other common ground or things. And I I think that in and of itself has become a a major problem for us as a society where it's just now us versus them. Now, certainly somebody who's hell bent on denying me and anyone else their second amendment rights, like, no, I'm not going to be friends with that person. Let's, let's be honest about that. And maybe I just put my foot in my mouth with what I said a moment ago, but (laughs) I think there are people who you can lead horses to water And they just haven't had anybody that was willing to even have a conversation with them about it. And, okay, well, I understand why you feel that way, but what about this? And and go down that road with them. Okay. And maybe you've opened a door that they don't walk through yet, but you keep having, you know, the curiosity gets peaked. And the next thing you know, they do walk through the door. And, hey, you can be there to shepherd them onto the, the side of, hey, you know, guns are not a bad thing and the Second Amendment is important. Here's the why. I it, it's diff- I think that talking to people that are either on the fence or haven't ever thought about the issue or disagree, but they're not sure why, you know, talking to those folks is definitely something that we could be doing better, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Second Amendment community. And I, I think the, the most useful, most effective thing that I do is when I'm talking to somebody like that is um, I paint out, you know, it's not about me. It's not about, you know, Michael Schwartz. And I want guns, and guns are cool, and the Constitution, and God-given right. It's about, you know, I, I've met so many people that need to be able to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know so many women who, you know, are able to defend themselves, whether they're in a poor neighborhood or they're in, you know, have been, you know, some kind of domestic violence situation. Painting that picture of... 
you know, humanize the issue, humanize the issue, showing them, hey, look, I care about people. That's why I want to do this. Yeah. You know, whereas in the past, uh, I actually gave a talk once to the local Republican Party, and there was this left wing hack of a journalist who happened to be there, and um, he, I gave this whole talk on like, look. The, the rhetoric at the time had gotten really charged, and this was over 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And I was basically saying, look, if you're talking to somebody who voted for this government and you're talking to them about the fact that, hey, they're, they're tyrants and I have a gun, that's not going to go over well. This is the government they voted for. So talk about the fact that, hey, I need to defend myself. I need to protect myself. We all need to defend ourselves and our neighbors and whatever. And I basically, uh, the whole gist of the talk was tamping down the rhetoric. And then this journalist, he wrote a story about me. You would have thought that I was calling for people to storm the Capitol <laughs> that night. I actually ended up calling him and having this you know, debate with him. And he put in a retraction and everything. But I was like, oh, my gosh. I've had maybe three or four really bad incidences with journalism. And yeah. that was the first and probably the worst. It was really, really bad. Um, but, uh, what, what's, what's a, what's something, what's a, a, a trick or a technique or something you use? What do you like to do when you talk to people who maybe aren't, aren't, aren't in full agreement with you? What, how do, what's the most effective way to get them to see things your way? I, I think first by under, trying to understand what their point of view is and what their, their hesitation or aversion or, yeah. or just flat out, you know, like, no, I, I don't think, um, and once you can kind of see the lens they're looking at it through, mm -hmm. it might give you an angle to say, okay, well, have you thought about it this way? Or, you know, here's an example of why what you're proposing is a problem for someone else. Maybe not me, but, you know, the, you know, a single mother who wants to be able to defend her kids. So right now we'll use the 18 to 20 cases as an example here, right? Um, we, you know, everybody loves to use, well, we let kids who are, you know, 17 with parental permission join the military and they get to carry machine guns and grenade launchers and all this cool stuff, right? Well, that's great. But how many women, you know, have kids when they're 18 years old and they might be a single mother and she has, uh, you know, uh, either a spouse or a boyfriend or whatever that's uh, abusive or, you know, has to deal with people harassing her all the time. Like, shouldn't an 18-year-old woman who has a family be able to defend herself? We're really going to say no to that? Well, well, get a restraining order. Okay, so now I have a, a piece of paper. That's cool. And if the cops get here in time, maybe something happens. But shouldn't I be able to have access to something more immediate for my defense versus a phone and, and a hope? One would think. Yeah. And I think, again, that, that humanizing, you know, that's just one example. Uh, but I think it really depends on what the person's hang-up is I, and trying to find some common ground or, or a way to explain it through a different lens. That's excellent advice. Basically, you know, yeah, asking more questions, yeah. trying to gain an understanding of where they're coming from, I think is excellent advice. So. I think sometimes it's from lack of experience. You know, here's here's my anecdotal example from dealing with my dad, and I've told this story many times. Like I grew up in a house that we didn't have guns, and my parents were very anti-gun, actually. Uh, I turned 18. I bought a shotgun. I stashed it under the bed. I think my brother ratted me out. Thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> I was told to get rid of it. Uh, I never did. But, uh, you know, I turned 21. I got my, my carry permit. I bought a handgun on my 21st birthday. My parents saw the permit come in the mail. They were like, you'll be dead within two weeks. Oh, geez. Okay. I guess. Um, but the reason I got it was because I had been then I was watching the news a lot more than I do today. And the one thing I had been seeing was that the world is a dangerous place and that you, in fact, are responsible for your own safety. Mm -hmm. You may get lucky and maybe the cops will show up. But at the end of the day, like that means that dude's got to put his life on the line for you. And he doesn't know me and maybe he won't even be there. Yeah. Um, so I, I, my dad, out of the blue one day, asked me to take him shooting. Wow. Okay, let's go. So I took him shooting, and I, I learned to shoot in Boy Scouts. That's where this all started. And I had the stupid smile on my face with these twenty-two, you know, single-shot <laughs> Marlin rifles. But I was grinning, you know, like a Cheshire cat. And I took him to the range, and you know, we went through the basic here, the safety procedures, and got him up on the line. He fired his first couple shots, and that stupid grin was on his face. And that's all it took. And it wasn't an overnight process with him. He went from being anti-gun to okay, maybe there's a place. And then he bought a gun and then he got a carry permit. And then it was, well, what do you need an assault weapon for? Like 30 round magazines. Nobody <laughs> needs that to like now today. He's like, yeah, I, you actually do need those. And, and, <laughs> and it, it took time. It, it was years in the making, but he went from very anti-gun to yes, 
I understand why somebody needs an AR-15 and why somebody should have a 30-round magazine. And I think that's what people can take away from this is it's not entirely impossible. It just takes, and, and his experience with guns was none. He only saw what he saw in the news and on media and what people told him. So when you have no personal experience with it, you're, of course, going to be influenced by outside sources. And if all your outside sources say the thing is bad, you're going to believe the thing is bad. Yeah. I think it's an important point. You were saying, you know, how do you talk to people? You're going to have a, a whole spectrum of people, some that feel strongly like your parents. You're going to have um, others like us that feel strongly on the other side. And you have a huge portion of the population that's somewhere in the middle. And if we're not talking about it, if we're not sharing, all that they're going to get is the outside stuff from the news, from schools, you know, whatever, you know, whatever negative opinion, because we're not proactively going out and, you know, kind of having the, those conversations ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a good so our mom and dad pro gun or are they well my, 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 my mom is not in the best health but uh, before it declined she did ask me to teach her to shoot too so and, and my dad now like i said like almost you know, 180 you could say and then went running down the path yeah um so very different view today than uh you know probably about 10 years ago actually at this point All right well my best to your mom yeah thank you where where uh, where are you from uh, I'm from outside Philadelphia. So you grew up outside of Philadelphia? I did. That's where they, where do you think that their uh, opinions came from? So my dad was born in the Bronx, grew up in central Jersey. My mm -hmm. mom was a Navy brat uh, for a little bit anyway. They ultimately settled down outside Philadelphia as well. Um, but I, I think it was just from a lack of experience with, with guns. I, I, I'm not sure it's fair to say my mom was super anti-gun, but I don't think she saw that there was a place or a utility for it. Um, you know, and growing up, I can think of one friend that had guns in the house that I was at least aware of. And, you know, his, his dad was a, a hunter, so there were shotguns and other stuff. And then of course, like he went hog wild buying guns and, and <laughs> like got cool things. Um, but I, growing up, I didn't really know anyone that, yeah, else that owned guns either, which I think, you know, uh, so for me, it was like playing video games and I, I can, I can still remember cause I graduated high school in 2005. I can still remember when the assault weapons ban was on the news because it was going to be expiring. And I went to the local gun shop and I got a Bushmaster catalog and I was flipping through that thing. Like, I'm going to buy one of these one day. It took me like another year or two. And I never bought a Bushmaster, but I did buy an AR-15. And it was just, I, I can remember we were talking about it in, I think it was history. Like, everybody in class knew I was going to buy an AR-15. <laughs> and that's crazy <laughs> to say out loud because today I think if you had that conversation in high school, you, yeah. would, you would end up in like the counselor's office, the police mm -hmm. would be at your home, and it would just be a totally different world. But You'd yeah. be investigated. So you, you never yes. got the Bushmaster? No, I never bought a Bushmaster. Christmas is coming up. Yeah, well, you know what? At this point, I've got enough <laughs> AR-15s that I'm not sure I needed, but maybe for nostalgic purposes, I'll find one. <laughs> I, yeah, I bought, uh, when I turned 21, I bought a Glock, a, uh, a Mossberg shotgun, a 500, and an AR. And, uh, you know, just I had to scratch the itch. Like, yeah. I'd been waiting my whole life, you know. And at the time, uh, my parents were... Um, not sold on the idea, especially my mom. And uh, but by the time I was done with her, she had bought a. Uh, she had a better AR than than I had. She had like <laughs> like a piston. I forget what it was. I want to say it like was, an LWRC or a PWS. It, it, I, I can't remember the manufacturer now, but she bought it. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> mom had a better AR than I did. So um, yeah, it's an interesting journey. I do. I've said before that one, the big advantage we have is it's more fun to shoot a gun than it is to ban a gun. Yeah. So, you know, and I don't, you know, take them shooting. Don't stop there, though. But just know you have this enormous, uh, you know, wind to your back when it comes to, to guns just by shooting with them. And, you know, so. Well, that's cool, man. It sounds like you're doing a great job at, at SAF. I'm doing my best. Yeah? You having fun? Yeah, have I you, am. Have you gotten recognized yet? Uh, no, and I hope I don't. Uh, no? You've never gotten recognized? <laughs> oh, well, like in public? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately for my YouTube days, uh, mainly industry events. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I get a lot of guff about that from some of my <laughs> colleagues. Um, but no, I mean, I... I'm. I would be nice to walk into a room at an industry event and, and some nobody having any idea who I was. Like, that would be cool. Uh, but I, I genuinely do enjoy talking to people. Um, it's it's. There's been a lot of interesting folks I've met over the years, and and I try to. Uh, you know, one of the things that I do. So you mentioned Alan giving you like genuine time. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, at least, that happened more so when I was doing the YouTube stuff than as of late. But I would get emails from either kids who were in college that were thinking about law school or law students that were. How do I do what you do? And I would always take the time to talk to them um, because people took the time to talk to me when yeah. I was younger. 
And I think that having a positive, just that conversation and being a resource for somebody who's looking to make the next step, like I owe that to the next generation, I think. Uh, somebody did that with me and I owe I owed that to pass that on. So that was one of the things that I, um, you know, wouldn't, would do. And I still, to this day, I think last year I spoke to another law student. Uh, actually, this summer, I think I spoke to a, a, a law, second year law student, had an internship at a, a, a organization that did first amendment stuff but was interested in you know this kind of law and hey can i get into that and what's that look like so how do i do what you do i don't know be be zero plan whatsoever in life uh, have <laughs> have people open some doors and you know do a good enough job that people were like hey come on on and and have an interest in giving it a shot that's cool man i think we need uh we need uh more passionate people when it comes to serving. not not i think we have a lot of passionate people but we uh, we need to be able to Track. convert that passion mm -hmm. into action. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to see a lot more of that. And I'd love to see, uh, and I think, you know, groups, groups, I think we're doing a better job of that than we ever have before. Yes. Um, and I think that there's a lot of room for, uh, for growth. And, uh, I like I like the fact that SAF, you guys are looking at the future. That's the only place to look, yeah. I, you know, the past is great. And I think one of the things that we did this year, because, it was important. It was our 50th anniversary, as you mentioned earlier. But um, I never knew SAF's history all that well, actually most of it, until I came to work here. And what I saw was, this is incredibly impressive. This is 50 years worth of stuff that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. If I don't know about it, and I considered myself pretty in tune with the, the gun community and, and at this point, like the nonprofit world, how does the average guy know about anything we've done? So I think it was important for us to tell our story about the last 50 years, but that doesn't mean that I'm only looking back and going, we did all this stuff, so you should support us. I'm looking at, well, what can we do in the next 50 years? How can we have an even bigger impact and who can we work with to achieve that? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's great when it's a SAF win. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But if someone else gets a Second Amendment win, that's good for us yeah. as a community. And yeah. I'm all about that. So that's why we do things like file amicus briefs and other people's cases and, and things like that because we all win, and that's what we're here to do. Yeah. that's. I actually uh, just put up a meme on San Diego County Gun Owners' Facebook page that I, I had made over the weekend that says uh, uh, friends – and then it lists, you know, SAF, you know, <laughs> FPC, NRA, CRPA, you know, all every, it's a whole alphabet, mm -hmm. you know, all <laughs> alphabet soup. Yeah. And then enemies, your inactivity, <laughs> you know, and then sdcgo.org slash volunteer. Um, I, I, people ask me frequently, like, well, who should I be supporting? And I tell them, look, if they're, if they're in the business of fight for second amendment rights, cut them a check. I got nothing against any of these groups. They're all doing a fantastic job. They're playing a different part of the field. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of overlap, you know, here and there between some of the organizations, and that's fine. You know, that's encouraged. Um, so, but SAF, I got to tell you, you guys are uh, knocking the cover off the ball. Oh, we're doing our best. Now, thank you so much. What, anything else? What else would you like our listeners to know about or do or hear or I mean, you know, so you, you just mentioned supporting groups. And, and yeah. the one thing I've always told people is that I, I, of course, want you to support SAF, but I don't want to bully people into it. And what I've always <laughs> said was, go take a look at what we're doing. Yeah. And if you like that and you think that's worth supporting, then support us. And if you can't support us today financially, tell your friends and family about us. Just share us out there in the world because that helps us too. And then when you get to a point where you can make a donation, and even the $10 helps, then go ahead and do that. But make sure you like what we do. And if we're not there yet, man, I hope we get there tomorrow or the day after that. And that's what I'm striving for. Awesome. Adam Kraut, Second Amendment Foundation. Awesome job, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Don't forget, put the dough back and donate. Second Amendment Foundation is our focus this this show this week. So go to saf.org slash individual. Do that now if you're listening to us live, but if you're listening to us on uh, Spotify or any other podcast provider, then uh, do it during the week. So saf.org slash individual. Okay, we're going to move on to our curtain call. All right, let's with do With Alicia it. Curtin. You ready? I am ready. This is sponsored by Straight Shooter. Straight Shooter mm -hmm. are awesome. These guys are so great. Um, heating and air conditioning. If you haven't taken advantage of their offer yet, please do. For $17.76, they will come and evaluate your system. 
Uh, they will make sure that you're on track, give you a tune up, you know, let you know if there's anything that needs to get done. But mainly, if you call them and get the 1776 deal, you're letting them know that, uh, hey, thanks for supporting Gun Owners Radio. So please, please, please give them a call. 619-922-3937 or go to straightshooter.ac. Straight Shooter, awesome guy, uh, awesome guys. Changes season, triggers a lot of people's allergies. The straight shooters can help you with their indoor air quality. Give them a call. Make sure that you can breathe easy and clean. All right. So um, what are we doing today? A uh, so we'll, call. Right. But before we roll into that, just yeah. really quickly, you were mentioning the $10 donation. We have yes. a super chat from Mike White to thank for. Hey, thanks, Mike. I, got, I met Mike at... Uh, the at, Gun Rights. At, yeah. You know, at your event. And I, it was a really nice meeting, Mike. I have a very unimportant question for you. I have a very unimportant answer right. for you. <laughs> so one of the, the, the things that gave me the biggest smile, in addition to the people, because, of course, the company was great. Who designed the uh, wording on the lanyards? Oh, the <laughs> silencer shop ones? Yes. Uh, the guys down at silencer shop. You can thank them for the humor they had up there on oh, that. that was great. That's yeah. Great. Uh, so I guess for, we can just share it with everybody. Right. I, I believe what the lanyard said was... Um, Biden will never get my guns. Right, because they're upstairs I or something along yeah, those I lines. I keep them upstairs. Yeah. Oh, uh, so see, somebody... <laughs> I didn't, uh, didn't. I didn't see that. that. Yeah, yeah. that's on hilarious. It was on the inside, yeah. so Silencer Shop branded branded on the outside because uh-huh. they sponsored our registration, yeah. and on the inside, it, it had that uh, language on it, which was, Amazing. as you said, funny. It was. Biden will never get my guns because they're upstairs. Yeah, I keep them upstairs. <laughs> nice. I like it. Yep. It was bugging me. I had to ask. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> All, right. All right, curtain call. So our curtain call. So you know, our curtain call generally that you know the kind of the, the spirit behind the intent of this portion is just to talk about a defensive gun use, and this one started as that potentially, and then it evolved into something else. If you're not familiar, there was a situation just a week ago today out of Burnett County in Texas. Are you familiar, Adam? I'm not. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about it. So it's it's been in the news. Um, you know, but what it is is there was a guy, and this is around 10.30 a.m. on a Sunday, who made a call to 911 uh, requesting police assistance at this church. Didn't really give a whole lot of information beyond that. So they, uh, so law enforcement had a response. They showed kind of thinking it was going to be a welfare check at that point because they didn't really have a whole lot of information to go on. When they arrived, there was a man who reported that he was the security, one of the security persons for this church, and that he had seen two people suspicious in the parking lot, one of whom had a rifle. And he uh, reported that he had this interaction with them. He felt the need to defend, and he took two shots in their direction. I guess the, he, st- well, he states that they then ran off in a white van and left. So the response to this was massive. This is Texas, right? Yeah, I've heard of it. Right. So, you know, rifle on church property, right? You know, if you think about you kind of the premise of this, there's already so much fear and concern about hate crimes, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's political or religious, whatever, um, safety in a church, right? There's some, you know, we got the whole thing with Israel and, and, you know, and all of that, that just the, there's been so much historically that's gone down that people. Sutherland shooting was in, I I think, Texas as Mm -hmm. well. Right. Yeah. So what the what they now so that's what this was put out as. So there was a huge response. They actually brought in um, some some federal um, some some federal federal agencies in addition to the local law enforcement, and it was a massive huge response. And they they got all these agencies involved looking for this white van, you know, looking for these people because the concern is if they were here now, where are they going to go to next? Because they're now on the loose. So uh, what? So fast forward twenty four hours. They have this guy in police custody that that made this report. They uh, interview him. It so with kind of the, the shortcut to the end of the story. He lied. Wow. There were no people. There was no rifle. He now and and there's they've not released any inform. They've released very limited information on this. We don't know his intent. He is talking to law enforcement, but they've not given us any inkling as to his reasoning behind what he did. Um, I mean, I have my own speculations and my own thoughts, but but really the concerning part of this is 
much like anything else you cry wolf you know what's you know what what is this going to do in the future what is this going to do to people's response if they hear something are they going to fail to respond or to react if there is a real life situation is law enforcement going to potentially kind of drag their feet and kind of wait and see or maybe not respond as they should you know kind of what what, what can the fallout from this be is a concern interesting in addition to what's going on in this guy's head he did fire two shots there were two casings he did admit to firing he did fire two shots that wasn't just a claim. He did fire, but there was nobody there to fire at. Interesting. So I don't think we knew that. This so, must have just this just came out then. So yeah, because I knew when Rich sent it, when, when yeah. we were talking about it, it was a real justified defensive shoot. The so this situation. is just some guy trying to be so a hero. That's that's my Aww. guess. My guess is that he didn't. I don't. know, Maybe he didn't feel important enough. Maybe he needed to kind of feel good about what he was doing there as security at the church. I mean, what, what do you? What are your thoughts on like? So my concern is the whole deadening people's you know it, much like okay i'm liking this okay on a range i'm not a fan of calling uh you know if you ever go to an outdoor range i'm a huge fan of what well, here's what i prefer the verbiage is important mm-hmm. if you you know if you like to give a warning that there's going to be a ceasefire that's scheduled to come up soon i'm a huge advocate for other, you know uh, giving a cold range warning i don't like throwing that word ceasefire out there as part of the warning you deaden people's senses to it Right, so I think that those reactions and responses need to be genuine, and it's important. We don't need to be lessening the importance or deadening. Oh, of course not. That's that's interesting. So, I think we because when we originally picked mm-hmm. the story, we thought it was a legit defensive right, gun user. Right, <laughs> turns out this guy's evolved. just a yeah. liar. Yeah, and I was going to be in for a bad time. Oh, honestly, I mean, charged him with three different three different counts. We say that we defend and we fight mm-hmm. for and we stand up for sane, trained, law abiding gun owners. Absolutely. And if you're not all three. I'm just not, not interested. You. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I get to tell you, I hope whatever consequence, I mean, I, we don't know the full story. Right. We so don't. They are, very, who knows? They are if, keeping if, this tight to the vest. If this, given. yeah. If this guy mm-hmm. needs mental health, I hope he gets the mental health treatment, and whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. But if it's as clean cut as this guy was jerking around and wanted to feel like a hero, I hope, I hope that he gets the maximum consequences mm-hmm. he has coming to him. Cause that's, uh, uh, it's not just a right. It's a huge responsibility. Mm-hmm. And he clearly, well, not clearly. He may have abused that responsibility, um, and which abuses that right and puts all of us in, in jeopardy. So, interesting. And two rounds being fired into who knows what direction. Yeah. There's a, there's concern there, too. That's interesting. All right. Well, there you go. There's the curtain call every week. We're going to have another <laughs> DGU uh, defensive a gun. Real use. A, a real one. Yeah, it might be a real one. Well, this one evolved, and I thought, you know, let's still talk about it. You get the Absolutely. mulligan in the new studio. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so deployment. We're going to talk about deployment, and then we're going to get uh, Sam on. He's going to answer a cool question. So deployment, every week we're going to talk about what's coming up and what we need you to do, and this one is sponsored by Red, White, and Badass Brew, which is my buddy Dustin. He he makes uh, awesome coffee. Go to RWBB Coffee, RWBB Coffee, which stands for Red, White, and Badass Brew dot com use code gor and you'll get 15 percent off so use code gor get 15 percent off buy some coffee um i get really good coffee i wasn't a coffee guy until this year i made it 48 years of my life and was not into coffee at all did better than me yeah <laughs> welcome to adulthood i know right and then i had I, it was actually i was i was coming to a, a radio show and i was a little tired and i stopped at a diner and had a Black cup of coffee. I was like, hey, I just need caffeine. It'll never be the same again. I was like, where have you been all my life? It'll never be the same again. <laughs> you know, I like the smell of coffee. I don't I don't drink it. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, check out Red, White, and Badass Brew. They actually have a... I uh, do buy it for my family. It's, oh, do you? Yeah. It's oh, like yeah. they have like a bourbon one? Yeah. Well, there's like a whiskey and a bourbon. Or that's what a... Whis- whiskey. whiskey business. Yeah. Yeah, it's called it. whiskey business. Yeah. My kid... Yeah, my family likes that too. <laughs> Okay, so don't forget, by the way, uh, dough back and donate, Second Amendment Foundation, saf.org slash individual. Okay, so here's what we need you to know. Here's the deployment for this week. We have our monthly meetings, the 16th, 17th, and 18th. That's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 16th, 6 p.m., North County Shooting Center. We need you to be there in San Marcos. The 17th is Wednesday. That's Poway Weapons and Gear in the beautiful Poway. Um, we need you to be there at 6 p.m. for our monthly meeting. And, of course, the 18th is Thursday at our at our uh, home away from home, La Bella's. Uh, everybody's going to get fed, but i got to tell you, La Bella's has got the best uh, pizza. So if you're trying to figure out which one you should go to, go to La Bella's. <laughs> if it's based entirely on food, 
Um, we have a lot of election things to talk about. We need you to attend 6 p.m. It's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Pick the one that's closest to you or the one that has the best pizza. Volunteer opportunities. So there are a bunch of volunteer opportunities. We're a month away from an election. We're trying to get our voter guide out as much as possible. Go to sdcgo.org slash volunteer. Pick a tabletop. Pick a an event or something that you can help us out with. Over 4,000 members. We need you to show up. We need you to you know take half a day, half a Saturday, morning or afternoon, and volunteer. We'll show you exactly what to do. We make activism easy. And, of course, vote need you to go vote, go to the county registrar of voters. It is not too late to register. You can actually, if you're not registered, you can go and vote, take a provisional ballot, uh, go and vote early. San Diego actually has, I know there's a lot of, I'm not going to get into voter fraud or whatever. San Diego actually has a very good tracking system. And if you get in there early and get your ballot in, uh, you'll get an email in a couple of days that say, hey, got your ballot. Thanks a lot. You'll mm-hmm. be actually it, there to track your own ballot. But if you vote on the very last day and they come back with, hey, we never got your ballot, there's nothing you can do. So if you vote early, you know, go down there and give them your ballot, and then you know you don't receive an email for a couple of days, then get down there and figure out what's going on with your ballot. Um, it's, a, it's a good system. And then last is intro to off-grid communications class. Man, if this, the two hurricanes that hit the East Coast haven't convinced you that uh, all things can, you know, uh, just fly out the window in a, during a natural uh, disaster, I don't know what will. So intro to off-grid communications class, October 19th. You can still sign up at gunownersradio.com. It's a $250 class. And if you sign up quick, you're actually going to get a radio with your uh, uh, with your uh, with your sign up. Actually, you'll get a radio anyway. But if you don't sign up before, I think it's like this week. I think they need to sign up by Wednesday, and you'll definitely have the radio in the class. Um, let me see. Yeah, and that's taught by uh, one of our board members, by the way, John Baldwin. He's going to teach you how to be a, a ham radio operator. I was kind of surprised. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but I was kind of surprised, Adam. We, we did this ham radio class at the gun show at the symposium. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I guess. Yeah, sure. There's no problem. And it was full. It was like one of the more popular classes. People were super interested in that. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you shouldn't say that. It, it kind of surprised me as well. Although I think, you know, certainly uh, the, the Baofeng radios, I know a lot of guys are using those. That that's it, that's the radio that they're giving away. Yeah, exactly. so <laughs> it, here we go, right? I'll admit it. I haven't bought my Baofeng yet. <laughs> <laughs> Despite seeing guys using them for like three years now, yeah. Like, yeah, I should probably grab one of those and and get on comms. I know the guys uh, at the range I'm a member of for the night shoots. They all use them at the night shoot to communicate from one range to another to for safety purposes. All the RSOs have mm-hmm. them and stuff. And like, okay, this group's moving to the next range, stuff like that. So certainly, in the context of a natural disaster, probably not a bad way to go to be able to get yeah. a hold of people when your phone doesn't work. Yeah. So check it out. Um, so there you go. Monthly meetings, go vote, volunteer opportunities, and then intro to off-grid communications. Second Amendment, man, it's not a spectator sport. We need you to be involved.